that also in turn that represents Jesus and the things that we don't do, the places we don't go, the things that we don't say. Jesus continues, and anyone who welcomes me, Jesus welcomes God. In this passage, Jesus is proclaiming his identity and equality with God. From this verse, we learn that Jesus is God. Of course, nowadays we know that Jesus is God. But in ancient times, Jesus needed to inform and educate people about his equality with God and his identity as God. During his time here on earth, his proclaiming that he was God was a, somewhat of a new revelation, a new thing. Jesus came to earth as God and took on human form to show the people God and God's love. Verse 40, anyone who welcomes you, my disciples, welcomes me. Anyone who welcomes me, welcomes God who sent me. Also during his time on earth, Jesus taught and showed the people God's love. Jesus did that by teaching, feeding, and healing the people. This teaching, feeding, and healing are the things that we're also called to do in our modern way. We teach, I teach from the pulpit, people are involved in church, uh, Sunday school, things like that. As teachers, we teach our kids, teach our family, sometimes teach our neighbors, wherever it happens to be. We feed, we have the food pantry here, participate in other uh, venues like that. And healing things, that can be giving someone a ride to the hospital, helping them get to a doctor's appointment, praying for them. So that is how we, in our modern time, we teach, feed, and heal. Continuing on the gospel, Matthew 10, verse 41. Anyone who welcomes a prophet and surrenders to that prophecy will receive a prophet's reward. According to our friends on Wikipedia, I use Wikipedia as a reference because I want people to have access to what I'm talking about. I don't always use Wikipedia. Sometimes I use other commentaries and books that are written by theologians and scholars, but I oftentimes use Wikipedia because it's Fairly accurate, it's very neutral. They don't take a stance one way or another about religion. So when I say from our friends at Wikipedia, I looked it up and this is their definition. So you can do that same thing. So from Wikipedia, in religion, a prophet or prophetess is an individual who serves as an intermediary between God and the people by delivering messages or teachings. So I don't claim to be a prophet, but here in modern times, these messages come in the form of teachings during Sunday school, Sunday sermons, that type of thing, other Bible studies that we do. In my seminary training, I was told that during my sermon preparation time as a pastor, as a pastor, I have I was to have a conversation with the text, the gospel passage. Ask the difficult questions of the text. And then to share the answers with the congregation during my sermons and during the other interactions that I have with the people. That is what I'm called to do as a pastor and that's what I'm hired to do here, is to have a conversation with that text. We have a serious text here Look at this one. It's the Washburn Holy Bible. That's a lot of Bible. So when I study, I refer to the text, ask this question, what does this mean in prayer? God, what is this? What does this mean? And I was taught that also that there's oftentimes footnotes in the bottom here that are written for our advantage to help us translate things because things can be translated into anything. So these footnotes oftentimes help us figure out what it is that they're trying to say. So that's what I'm called to do, is have those difficult conversations with the text. Ask those questions. God, show me. Show me, Holy Spirit, what that's about. Speak to me. I don't understand this. And I 
start out early in the week of my sermon preparation and then I read the scripture and ponder on it, uh, pray about it. Oftentimes I walk the labyrinth we have here. That's a good labyrinth. If you need to figure something out, go out and walk the labyrinth. Say, God, show me this. Show me the way, the truth, and the life. What am I supposed to do with us? The labyrinth was developed years ago for people who needed to pray. Oftentimes people walked and prayed. And if they kept walking and praying, they would be out of town, out in the country. So they developed labyrinths so they could just go around and pray as they went and how many ever times they needed to do. And some of those labyrinths were very elaborate. This way they stayed where they were supposed to be, where it was safe, where they were handy, instead of walking out into the country and who knows when they're going to be back if they're praying a long prayer, they might be gone a while. So anyway, like I said, I do not consider myself to be a prophet, but I share the answers I get by having a conversation with the text. Speaking of a cold cup of water, in modern times, that can be water bottles. Continuing with the words of Jesus from Matthew 10, verse 41, and anyone who welcomes a righteous person and conforms to the righteousness that proceeds from him or her will receive the reward of living a righteous life. So again, according to Wikipedia, Righteousness is a quality or state of being morally correct and justifiable. It can be referred to as being an upright person or someone who lives an upright life. So that all sounds good, but how do we gain righteousness so that we can live that upright life? Well, we referred to that big book I have, or the ones you have. We find the way to gain righteousness Righteousness and humility in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew 5 through 7. So today the Gospel Patch is in 10. This is Matthew 5 through 7. So you back up a few chapters. Matthew 5, verse 1. It says, well, now when, now when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain, as Moses had done before him, and he sat down with his disciples gathered around him. The men, women, and children, the plants and animals were all around Jesus, the sheep and the goats and the dogs and the cats and who knows what, I don't know, maybe they had llamas there, I'm not sure what all was there. All of God's creation was present and included. So in this story, all of God's children were welcomed and included. Chapter 5, verse 2, and Jesus began to teach them and he did that by sharing his teaching or sermon with the crowds. That's why it's called Sermon on the Mount. And that's where we get that name. So by that example is why we pastors preach from the pulpit. So we do our teachings. So Matthew 5, verse 3 through 6, Jesus said in the Beatitudes, that that's part of what this is, Blessed are the spiritually poor, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek and gentle, they will inherit the earth. And verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. This is that righteousness they're talking about. Another verse from Matthew. One you might recognize, you may have learned it in the King James. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and the righteousness of Christ, and all these things will be added unto you. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. I found that possessions and belongings fill up garages and closets, our houses, things like that. But they don't do a lot of other stuff that can get in the way. That's why it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And that righteousness will be given to us. So today the verse that I really want to focus on is Matthew 10, verse 42. And it says, and anyone who, gives, who has given so much as a cup of cold water 
to one of these little ones, because that person is my disciple, I tell you that person will be rewarded. So to bring this into our modern context and apply this to our lives today, I ask the following question. What is a a cup of cold water? And what does a cup of cold water look like in this modern time? In Psalm 13, Karen read the psalm she read. It sounds like the person in Psalm 13 could use a cold cup of water. This is a prayer for deliverance from enemies. This is a psalm of David. And it's also an example for us as how to pray. How do we talk to God? How we can talk to God? Because David is having a conversation with God, a serious conversation. He says, how long, Lord, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? Consider and answer me, O O Lord my God, with an exclamation point. He's demanding an answer. We can go to God and expect answers. We can pray. Lord, how long? And you might be in one of those situations. How long, Lord? Do you hear how desperate this person is? He says, how long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? Maybe we can relate to this person. Maybe we know someone like that. So what is a cup of cold water? What does a cup of cold water look like uh, for us in our modern time? We can look at this cold cup of water, literally, and assume that it's actually a cup of water or a bottle of water these days. Or this passage can be taken figuratively, and the cup of cold water can be seen in many different ways. For one, it can be welcoming a stranger by actually seeing them instead of looking right through them, greeting them or actually talking to them, or by actually listening to them. That's one way. When I was in my chaplaincy training at LA County General Hospital in East Los Angeles, we had one of the chaplains, Father Bob Jones, who's passed away now, as one of our teachers. He was a Catholic priest, uh, taught at a Catholic seminary in Southern California, and then he was a chaplain at the hospital for many years. And he'd take us into this big hospital. LA County General Hospital is a huge place. It's a $1 billion facility they built back in 2009. So you can about imagine how large it is. Any given day, there's two or 3,000 people in that hospital. The doctors and nurses, people who work there, the patients, it's a 900 bed hospital. Plus they have all these clinics. People come in to get services. So there's several people there, several people working, Uh, People from all over the world come there to teach. People from all over the the world come there to learn. Doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists. All those different departments that you see, they do that training there. So Father Bob would take, you know, the first day he's training us, this first time I did this. He says, when you come into the lobby, when you're in the hallways, you'll see people cleaning. You'll see people... uh, all in the trash, dump in the trash, any kind of thing. He said, well, stop and talk to them. And he'd come in and he'd have us three or four chaplaincy students behind him. And he'd, he'd stop and see some woman who was scrubbing the floor or some man was sweeping or something like that. And they'd say, he'd talk to them and say, good morning. Thank you for cleanness. It always looks so nice and clean here. And the person would be going, uh, what? This person's talking to me. And he'd say, well, thank you. And the people hauling the garbage, he'd say, thank you for doing that. I appreciate this place being clean and kept up. And they, they were just like shocked. Because they're used to people just going by them because they're part of the invisible people. So I learned that from him, from Father Bob. And I'm very thankful for that. So I tried to do that too. So part of my ministry seems to be talking to people whom I've never met. A few, a few weeks ago, Ann and I were in Costco with Ann's parents, and 
we're in one of in one of those intersections. You know, you have those big carts. You ever been to Costco? You got those super duper big carts, and people try to get through the hallways and the intersections where the they come together out of one stack of uh, all these boxes of stuff, and then you're trying to get around, and then the the cash register place backs up into the, you know you got this big line, and so we get to this place and we're just kind of um, stuck there. It's gridlocked at Costco, so I'm standing there, and there's another guy coming the other way, and I kind of look at him and say, "Hey, how's it going?" He said, "Well, uh, my blood sugar was getting kind of low, so I had pizza and ice cream." I said, "Really?" Then he took out his phone and he held it up to his arm like this. And I'm looking at him. And he says, no, I'm good. I said, okay. His comments about pizza and ice cream made me wonder if my blood sugar might be getting a little low too. So then he was holding his phone up to his bicep. When he did that, he made me, it made me wonder if he might be an alien from another planet or something. Hopefully they're with us. Or a robot or something. So I asked him, how does that work? He said, well, he rolled up his sleeve and he said, well, I got this device that sticks to my arm and there's an app in my phone. Oh, the, the train is right on time. And he holds it up to it and it reads it. He says the patch lasts about two weeks. Lord bless the people on the train. They're not in church today, but we, we pray for them anyway. And he says that this sticks on my arm for about two weeks, and then it falls off, and then I get a new one. So we're standing there talking to him, and people are trying to get to the pizza samples because they're like behind me. And we're, we're blocking in there, trying to get around and getting these looks. And I don't know what's going on. And my wife's mother says to Ann, does Wally know that man? Ann said, no, he just talks to strangers. I didn't know him, but I know him now. And I, all, and I know all about his medical situation. I guess maybe he just needed someone to talk to and someone to listen to him. So for him, his, our conversation might have been just a cup of cold water. Maybe that's all he needed. He was there by himself. So you just never know. Another way of offering a cold cup of water is carrying out our affirming part of our welcoming and affirming status here at our church. And we met about that in church council and with the open and affirming uh, committee. One of the things we talked about was changing the sign so it says open and affirming instead of ONA because nobody was for sure what ONA meant. They thought it was Ohio Nurses Association, which we like nurses and bless them, but that wasn't what it stands for. But I see the sign has been changed, so that's good because I didn't want people to misinterpret what that meant. So offering a cold cup of water can be providing that safe space for someone who has been not been welcomed at a church or unwelcomed because of their sexual identity or their race or their social location, the color of their skin, something like that. So we're opening and affirming here, welcoming as a safe space. A cup of cold water might be inviting, like inviting someone to come to church. You realize how refreshing it is to see some familiar faces that we haven't seen for a while? Or maybe see some new faces? That would be refreshing. That'd be like a cold cup of water to us. You have someone new or someone returning. But people come to church when they're invited. I mean, we can send out the flyers and we can do all this, that, and the other kind of thing, which we can do. But the best way to get people to come to church is to invite them. Invite somebody you know. Because you've probably had people come to you and say, oh, we'd like for you to come to your church. And neighbors come to your door. And I don't know who they are, and I don't know where their church is, and I'm probably not going to go to their church. I mean, I might, but you never know. But if it's someone you know, I might more, be more likely to follow up on their invitation. 
So I encourage you to invite people you know, your doctors, nurses, guy washes your car, changes your oil, mows your yard, your neighbors. Uh, anybody that you know can be invited. And you might think, well, I know they, they already have a church. Well, maybe they do, maybe they don't. And they might come. It might be one of those times where, you know, I need to make a change. I'm going to go to a different church. I know I've been at this church a long time, and they may want something else, and they might be interested or curious about, so what happens here at the UCC Congregational of Vermilion at 990 State? Well, the trains go by during the sermon, for one thing, but there are other things that happen here. So encouraging some folks to rejoin us for worship, and I'm going to do that now, because I know there's people that are watching. COVID is over. We're not masking anymore. I encourage you to come back to church. If you want to wear your mask, you can. I won't ask you to take it off. I know early on I was doing pulpit supply at a church and everybody had their mask on and I looked out at the congregation and I said, oh, it feels like I'm preaching to a bunch of bank robbers. Nobody seemed to find that very amusing that day, but it's much funnier now than it was then. But it might be greater, you know, it's, it's fine to watch the service live stream through your computer at home, wherever that is, but it's very different being in church as compared to watching it on your computer. It's like hearing the hymns sung on the coming through your computer or TV as compared to actually singing the, the hymn here in the congregation, present for the family of God. It's very different. It's like hearing the choir sing as compared to singing in the choir. Those are two very different experiences. And while we're on the subject of singing, come and join the choir. Ted, do you need more people in the choir? Always. Always, that's right. Participating in the choir can be like a refreshing cup of cold water. So that's a whole, you know, that's a different group. If you're in the choir, I've sung in church choirs before, and you get together for practice and get together other times, and it's just fun because it's kind of separate from the, the church the other stuff, uh, even as a pastor I sang in the choir and that was fun because it was it was lighter, I wasn't working I'm up here, I'm working because you hire me to do this, but when we were at choir practice I was goofing around with everybody else because that's part of what you do, it's a, diff it's a different fellowship so I encourage you to, to think about that or you could go and see Godspell with us That'd be like to get, we get a cup of cold water there, too. We have a fellowship. We need to start doing things again. COVID's over. So come and join us for that. Sharing a cup of cold water with ourselves can be our awareness that Jesus goes with us in everything we do and say. Just that revelation of, yeah, Jesus is with us everywhere we go. That's refreshing. The Holy Spirit inspires us, draws us, empowers us. That's refreshing. So getting back to our scripture, in verse 40, Jesus said, Anyone who welcomes you, my disciple, welcomes me. Or the other one is receives, I believe, the other word that we use. Anyone who receives me, receives God who sent me. And also from our lectionary, there was a verse from Romans, Romans 15, 7. It says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. This welcome that glorifies God is the same welcome that Ann and I have received here. You folks welcomed us and received us in the name of Jesus, and that glorifies God. Along with that welcome, you are welcoming Jesus to join us. And along with welcoming Jesus, you're welcoming God who sent Jesus another cup of cold water. Along with the welcome comes being received. Ann and I are being welcomed and being received this Sunday. And I appreciate that. And along with that welcome comes a reward for all of us. Amen.
At this time, we do our prayers. Listed in your bulletin as prayers with silence. And we go into the Lord's Prayer. We want to have a space, a place that's silent. Then we can all mention someone's name. Do that out loud if you'd like, or silently. God hears all that. Let's just have a quiet time of prayer before God. join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to start taking offering in person, passing the plates so the ushers would come forward. Let's give as you are able. Well, there's been times when I didn't have any money to pay or I'd already paid my tithe and the plate would go by and I would just put my hand in and in my concerns and my thankfulness and things like that in the plate as it went by. You can do that too. So please take the offering. stand for the doxology. Thank you, Lord, for these offerings, tithes and offerings. I ask that you would use them as you see fit. Thank you for blessing us so greatly.
may be seated. For communion, there's an insert in your bulletin. For returning to communion by intinction. So when we do that, we'll have you come forward. I'll explain that as we go. I know it might have been a while. Karen's going to help me with this. So we'll follow through as the insert says. Um, when we get to that point, Karen and I are going to come down the steps. And I'll have the bread and I'll say, body of Christ broken for you and give you peace. And you take and dip it in the cup, the chalice that she is holding. That's the intinction part. And she'll say, blood of Christ shed for you. So when she's standing on this side of me, this side of the church will come forward. And when that side is complete, she'll switch and be on this side. And that side will come forward. You'll get, receive the elements and return to your seat. Or if it goes some other way, that'll work too. You'll just have maybe a gridlock. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's, uh, it's just fine however it works. And I'll explain that as we go. So if you have your insert, follow along. I'll give the invitation, as it says. I'll say the one part, you guys say the many. And then the prayer of communion on that front page, I'll read all of that. And then you'll join on the back part of the where it says all. So, this is the invitation. The spirit of creation is with you. And the spirit of creation is lost next to you. Open wide your hearts and souls. We open them to the creation of love. Let us give thanks to God of earth and rain. is the prayer of communion that I'll read. We delight with our holy God on this earth and we rejoice forever in which in what God has created, is creating and will be created. The spirit of creation builds built this vast universe including our beautiful strong and fragile planet. The earth held the plants and animals in the garden of Eden. Later the earth carried the Israelites on their wilderness journey and while they danced joyously in the promised land. The earth absorbed the tears of Job, supported the steps of the prophesying Elijah, and carried David in the shadow-filled valleys. Jesus taught on mountains and plains, walked throughout the land, healing the aching, and prayed in gardens late at night. In times of exile and times of return, the land held the stories of our ancestors in faith. Today we abide on this earth in houses of worship, in homes, and in halls. We know this land we share today is sacred. It bears much fruit. It holds the flora of friendships, and deep within its cells are the stories of its ancestors, parents, guardians, and leaders of the faith. We know the footprints are still felt on the, by the earth. And we remember the ones who held this land as their own centuries ago. They were the first to tend the, to the land, to nurture it as a parent would nurture their children. The winds of occupation seared the land and crushed the hearts and lives of its first inhabitants. Through the hydrating tears of our God, the land remembered its strength from its ancestors. In our spaces today, we remember their place on the land and their care of creation. From the strength of those who have gone before comes the seeds for grains and grapes. The land has given birth to the fruits of our sacrament. With glory to our God, we praise the spirit of creation. We all would be holy, 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 spirit of earth, air, fire, and water, heaven and earth delights in your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who brings love and light to our world. Hosanna to our God, hallelujah. This insert is actually 
from the General Synod 34 that's happening now, I believe it's in Indianapolis, and they sent this out for us to participate in, so we would stand in solidarity with them. People from all over the denomination, all around the denomination are gathering there, and uh, that's why it's included today. So the night before Jesus walked the ground carrying the tree to Golgotha, he gathered with faithful friends. From the grain in the ground came the bread that Jesus took and broke in his hand. He blessed the bread and said to his friends, This is my body broken for you. When you eat this bread, remember me. Jesus raised the bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples. And then after supper, Jesus took a cup, filled it with the fruit of the vine, knowing they were all connected like the vine and the branches. Jesus said to them, this cup is a new covenant and my blood. As you drink from the cup, remember me. Spirit of God, just as you have hovered over creation and renewed your church at Pentecost, surround these elements, encircle us, energize our souls, and connect us with each living being here on earth. Just as you have delighted in humans since creation, may your presence create joy in our spirits, transforming us into new beings. Bless the soil that birthed the grains and grapes that we share today. May these elements be transformed into a meal that connects us all, like the lion and ox, like the lamb and wolf. We eat together, whether near or far, whether well or ill, whether marginalized or privileged. May this meal be one in which we embrace the power we have and strengthen the world with justice and peace, kindness and love. Now we'll distri distribute the elements. This bread is my body. Broken just for you. Take this cup. I
This bread is my body. Broken just for you. Please join me in a prayer of thanksgiving as printed on the insert. We'll sing that last, we'll say that last part together. Prayer of thanksgiving. Holy God, divine designer, with gentle compassion, unite us as vine and branches. Whether near or far, for a meal we share our gratitude with thanksgiving and voice our joy for our siblings in faith share the table with Christ and with us. Our souls are rejuvenated in your holy refreshment. Send us into the world today with joy in our hearts and excited to proclaim your radical love in this world. Amen. Number four is our sending hymn. I didn't say closing hymn because it's a sending with book that be sent out and do the things that Jesus did. He taught, healed, fed with a cold cup of water. Let's join in the sending hymn number four. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. <laughs> Oh, 
seraphim and the seraphim falling down to be In the way of a benediction, I send you out with your cold cups of water. You see folks that need a prayer, need a cold cup of water, need a blessing, need someone to listen to, someone to talk to. I ask that you would remember this. I send you out to do that. In the name of Jesus, amen.
mostly quarterbacks. <laughs> well, I used to like, 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 like,